take more than one so you can share it with your friends. I'm going to turn off the lights so that we can see um, these pictures a little better. And please excuse my um, somewhat, uh, I'm not the best at the, uh, at the slides here, but I will do my best. Um, these are the images um, that a lot of Americans have of the Middle East. But we see a lot of faces of despair. And when uh, we have several, Sonia said she was a colleague of mine and she continues to be even though she has a bit of a different role. Um, we have about 12 staff around the United States who work on the uh, issue of Israel and Palestine and Iraq and Lebanon and whatever else. Um, I think we're going to have to take Iran on in the next year. Um, but we're all kind of Middle East um, specialists, experts, junkies, uh, whatever you want to call us. And we get together a couple times a year, a year and talk about the organizing work and the educational work that we're doing in our communities. And about two years ago, uh, we met together and we're feeling the weight of the conflict, like, like we still do. But uh, two years ago in particular, we were really we were looking at the wall being built um, and we were looking at the increase in suicide attacks, and we were looking at the uh, continued um, poverty and, and so forth, and we thought, okay, now that's not exactly something that is gonna pull people to come to events. Like, <laughs> people are not gonna like, okay, what do I do with my Saturday night? Let's go hear about, you know, the violence in the Middle East. Um, <laughs> So we came up with an idea of a campaign that would focus on things that we feel point in the direction of hope. Um, what is there that is hopeful? We asked ourselves the question, what, well, what sustains us? If we think that the, the, the violence and the hardship that is facing the people in the Middle East is just going to continue forever, then what are we doing? <laughs> well, let's, let's all work on uh, you know, fair trade or something, but um, we're, we might see some, you know, um, some successes. But then as we thought about what it is that gives us hope about the Middle East, because of course you can't work on the Middle East unless you have hope, and unless you organize for hope, because otherwise, I'm crazy. <laughs> I mean, you just get too depressed. So we knew that we all had hope, and we talked together, and, and we're a group of, uh, our staff includes Jewish people, includes Muslims, it includes um, people from the Middle East, it includes Quakers like me. Um, and we talked about what we saw happening a couple of years ago, which was kind of a resurgence of nonviolent resistance, a refusal to accept the status quo, of people really beginning to say, you know what, we're, we're, we're not going to rely on the outside world to solve our problems. We've kind of given up on that, that negotiations and things happening at that level. It, it's going to make much difference in our immediate lives. We're going to we're going to work from where we can, which is in our communities, and which is, you know, starting starting with ourselves. And um, so we we decided that we would would try to highlight what we saw Israelis and Palestinians starting uh, doing doing various work. Now, one thing that I, I noticed that there's like five or six competing workshops afternoon and they all seem to be on the same topic <laughs> but but actually I think it would have been interesting given that we all have some approaches to this question of nonviolence to maybe clarify what are some different approaches because um, I believe that a lot of what I witnessed when I was a teacher living there for three years when I traveled back there for, um, you know, almost every year since then, 
is that daily life is about nonviolent resistance. Standing in line at a checkpoint and not going crazy because you've had to be delayed for two hours to get to your job, to get to the hospital, to get to visit your aunt, that is nonviolent resistance for just doing it and not beating somebody up or, or blowing yourself up or, you know, not, just, so I feel that, um, and, and, and in many ways, of holding on to a culture despite everyone trying to erase it. Um, trying to stand up to militarism that you see in your community, a glorification of guns, a, a, a sense of, you know, showing your power by your weapon, all, that there were a lot of Israelis and Palestinians who were saying no to that. But we don't hear about them. We don't frame the question, in, and we don't look at the conflict from that kind of um, perspective. So this campaign was to try to uh, change that. So what do we do? <laughs> I see we have a little one step at a time kind of thing. Sorry about that. Um, well, one thing that the American Friends Service Committee does that um, maybe you've attended one of our events somewhere around the country or you've read about um, it, uh, a, a common method that we use is to bring speakers from the Middle East to the United States to talk about the daily realities in Israel and Palestine or in Iraq in the case of, or Lebanon in the case of the um, conflicts there. And what we, so what we did with, with our Faces of Hope campaign was to bring some Israeli conscientious objectors to the United States to talk about why they became conscientious objectors. That's different than the refuser movement in Israel, but similar. They're both saying they don't want to be part of the military, they don't want to do their military service because of their moral and conscious re reasons. Um, some will just say we don't want to be occupiers and we won't participate in an army that occupies others. But then there are also young Israeli conscientious objectors who say we don't agree with militarism at all. And we, we're not only not going to serve in the, in the um, territories in the West Bank and Gaza, but we're not going to serve in the military at all. And those happen to be a lot of young people a lot of very idealistic young people who actually went to prison for, for their um, beliefs. Some are people that did serve in the military and had a, a crisis of conscience, that they had some experience that made them see that they could no longer be part of, um, be part of the army. So that's one thing is that we've, what we've done is that we've t brought Israeli conscientious objectors here to the United States. We've also organized delegations to go to the Middle East. In fact, we have one leaving next week to help with the olive harvest. And you, as you'll see in a minute, we think that the olive harvesting is also an act of nonviolent resistance of farmers who despite all the odds, despite sometimes having the wall going right through the middle of their field, will continue to go and pick, um, pick their olives. So it's also, as you, well, I'll talk more about the olives stuff later. Um, we also have Quaker staff based in Jerusalem who work very closely with the nonviolent movement in Palestine. Some people say, well, I didn't even know there was a nonviolent movement in Palestine. There is, there are several organizations as well as community groups who are trying to look at the methodology used by Gandhi and King and others um, to integrate into their protests and so forth. And we have staff, um, Quaker staff in Jerusalem who've been working with that, and so they've come here to talk about it. And we've also brought Palestinian activists and youth organizers to come and talk about their work. Um, we brought a farmer from a, a, West, a West Bank town, um, never been to the United States before. I like to joke about how 
we sent him out to Milwaukee, and <laughs> one of the places that he stayed, the woman called, I said, do you have any pets? Now, he's a farmer, so I figured he'd be okay, you know, animals. And, uh, and she says, well, I have a dog. And I said, well, you know, Palestinians are a little nervous around dogs, but, you know, um, it, it, it should be okay with the dog. So I picked him up from the train the day after he stayed there in Milwaukee back in Chicago, and he said, what's with you Americans and your pets? And I said, I said, oh, did the dog keep, keep you up? And he says, yes, the dog slept outside the door, and I kept thinking that he was going to come in, and he says, but what's with the snake? I said, what? <laughs> and the person who both just the mentioned that they had a boa constrictor um. in their house <laughs> that was in the room where he had to try to sleep. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, oh, so <laughs> he was a bit horrified. Uh, and I said, most Americans do not keep boa constrictors <laughs> in their house. So as you can see, speaking tours have all kinds of opportunities for learning and exchange. Um, <laughs> uh, we've also brought youth organizers from Gaza and the West Bank. And um, if you want me to tell you more about their work, it's quite exciting, the, the youth uh, leadership development work that they're working in and communities that don't generally have programs for youth after school. So. They tend to be in villages up in the Janine area in the northern part of the West Bank or um, uh, in the south near Hebron and in Gaza that's often overlooked in terms of uh, um, much of anything actually these days is pretty pretty grim. Um, but the youth organizing that they do is, is to have youth in the community identify what are some changes that they'd like to see, what are some things that they would like to change. And in Janine, for instance, a youth group um, said, well, they identified together that, and these are high school students, that they felt too isolated from the rest of the world. And they really wanted to connect with other youth, uh, um, in, even in Palestine. So they decided they wanted to build an airport. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think that's a great story. You know, like, and, and the leader of the youth group says, okay, airport, let's, what would you need if you were going to build an airport? And had them research it and, you know, took them seriously. And, you know, after a couple of weeks, they came back and said, you know, I don't think we're going to get an airport. <laughs> and, you know, no airport has yet been built in Janine, but they did build a bus shelter and they felt very proud of that and it was something that they contributed to their community. So that's the kind of thing that to me, offers a lot of hope to know that there are young people uh, who are still caring about just making good in their community and trying to highlight some of those <coughs> stories. Um, we started a newsletter online, and every month we put up new articles that feature um, people who we think give hope. Um, they will write about um, what is going on in their community. This month we have some new articles by uh, some Israeli citizens, that we, uh, young Israelis that we brought here to the United States and they're reflecting on their um, experiences uh, visiting here, but also a lot of their friends are going into prison this month um, because they're refusing to, to go into the military. Um, but we also have other things, uh, ways that people can get involved in writing their representatives or um, uh, otherwise, you know, being active on the issue. We also realized that there wasn't a lot of literature out there about nonviolent resistance um, or, as again, going back to this issue of how do people frame the issue, how do they look at at this, at the, this problem. And two of these resources I brought here today, um, they're really nice looking. <laughs> and I think they really have some great information with a good bibliography, etc. So do take, take um, some copies of these. 
but it's a whole history of looking at 1967 to the present. You know, we're coming up on 40 years uh, this next year on the occupation, and these um, these give some some background material. So, with our phases of hope campaign, we have produced those the new literature. One of the things that I'm really excited about was um, something that we did this fall, which I said that we have bring, uh, we've been bringing uh, young people, uh, you know, people to come speak in the United States. Um, often, what you ha what happens when speakers are brought to the United States is they come and they speak for at a civil conference and they speak at a church gathering and they. Um, might do a radio interview, and they're whisked from town to town to town. And if you happen to be the unlucky one that's on the last end of their tour, <laughs> it almost sounds like, you know, they're just exhausted. And it's really hard for um, the speaker, and it also really gives communities not a lot of time to get to know them. Like, if, if somebody comes to your church and you, you meet them and you say, gee, I, you know, I'd really like to get to know this person better. Well, they're probably going to be gone by the next day. So we, what we wanted to do was create a program, which we call apprenticeship, where we would bring people here and have them stay in one place for a month. And so we brought, um, uh, this, this fall we brought six Israelis Four of them are Jewish Israelis, two are Palestinian citizens of Israel, all six of them between the age of 17 and 20. And they got to know each other a little bit in Israel before they came here. And then they came and went to different offices around the United States, AFSC offices. And they worked in our offices. And they got to meet young people their age. They got to participate in some of our anti-war organizing. They talked about their experiences in friends' meeting houses, at synagogues, at di different places, um, schools. And they, so they also got a little bit better sense of what it is, what America's about. Um, we did some very interesting things when they first got here for their orientation. We're asking them, well, what do you, what do you think you're gonna be asked about? You know, what are gonna be hard questions for you? And then we asked them, at the end of the month, um, you know, okay, well, what did you think? And were you surprised by things? And, and they were, you know, they, they really had learned a lot. Um, and they also learned things that we would have never planned for, like one um, young man who was worked in our Philadelphia office and got to go to uh, New York City and Washington, D.C. for some of the protests that were organized around the Declaration of Peace that happened in September, um, he, he said, you know, I never thought about having musical instruments in a demonstration <laughs> <laughs> or singing. He said, you know, people were like singing and the police were kind of nice <laughs> to the demonstrators. I said, well, that's not always the case. But, you know, and, and he just, that was a total eye-opener for him. He said, you know, we would never sing to the police in our country. And I said, well, try it. You know, see if, we, you know, maybe singing actually might create a whole different atmosphere. And I happen to notice that they are having a protest this weekend, uh, a gathering before these two young Israelis are, are put in prison for being conscientious objectors. And I noticed that they had, were having a band come. <laughs> you know, that was uh, that was exciting. And because it was kind of a, what they call themselves a mixed delegation, because there were Palestinians and Israelis, they were all citizens of Israel, and the two Palestinians who were with them, uh, their first language really is Hebrew, because they grew up in Israel, they had to learn Hebrew, uh, they went to schools where Hebrew was the dominant language. So it was very interesting to watch that dynamic and to have them talk about being, um, you know, discriminated against in Israel and what dynamics that brought into the group of, of six. So 
Um, and we learned to not forget about that 20%, that 20% of Israelis are Palestinians uh, whose families never left in 1948. And uh, it's, a, it, it's an important community, and many will turn to that as the bridge. You know, in the future, whatever, if it's going to be one state, two states, binational states, confederation, whatever the end run is, it probably will likely be those Palestinians who've lived in Israel, know both cultures to, to provide um, some interesting opportunities. And um, when, you, when you talk to them about that, they kind of say, hey, 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 don't be expecting little miracles from our community. But nonetheless, it, it, was, um, it was really exciting to have them here. And this is the group. <laughs> you see the two uh, older looking people on <laughs> Adam doesn't look so much you older. The guy on the right is my colleague, Adam Horowitz, and he works in our national office uh, in Philadelphia. That's Mary Dyer that's behind everybody. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Mary Dyer. But that was the group that came. As you can see all different, you know, like, it might be kind of hard to pick out which ones are the Arabs and which ones are the Palestinians. We also, this fall, um, brought uh, um, Palestinian youth coaches. Um, these are the young, these are volunteers who are college age, who are working with these high school groups of, um, of Palestinian youth groups around the West Bank and Gaza. Our, our staff from uh, the, the youth coach from Gaza wasn't able to get out, um, given terrible, terrible situation in Gaza right now. Um, but two were able to leave from the West Bank. And it was very interesting when they arrived in Philadelphia, um, the border person um, asked them where they were from. And there are two young women, I think they're 18 and 19. And they said, um, here's some pictures of them. They said, where are you from? And Dima, the one on the left, said, um, Palestine. He says, well, since that's not a place, I guess you'll have to tell me where you really are from. And she said, uh, I'm from Palestine. And um, would you like me to show it to you on a map? He says, I bet you won't be able to show it to me on the map because it doesn't exist. But she was like, <laughs> she's like, whoa, what's this? You know, <laughs> Welcome to the United States. Uh, and it was, it, it if she said that she really wasn't prepared for that. Now, both of them were very nervous about coming here. Their parents were absolutely scared to death about them coming because they think that all Americans hate Arabs. Uh, the whole and post 9 11 sentiment. It, yeah, yeah, right. All the 9 11 and um, you're Muslim and be careful and don't say where you're from and all this stuff. and. And Dima said, well, I wasn't going to do that. I'm just going to say where I was from. And, um, but it ended up that they spent two hours with that guy <laughs> entering, arguing about where she was from. And of course, they went through every single thing that they brought with them and got the full treatment. But Dima and May went to um, our Los Angeles and Chicago offices and met a lot of people, um, got to see youth organizing in this country. Um, and connected with uh, one on the right at the top with uh, a young African-American uh, male youth organizing project that started in Chicago recently. Um, and really, when I asked the two of them at the end of their month here what it was that they got out of this, um, they said, you know, I've got all kinds of ideas about the future that I didn't have before. And I see so many possibilities. Like he said, I want a country where you don't, you can just walk where you want, and you don't have to have your ID with you all the time, and um, you know, I, no checkpoints. This just this freedom is so exciting. And they said, we never knew about that. You know, mm -hmm. we never in our whole lives. I mean, our pa our grandparents have talked about that time, but we haven't experienced it. And and they also said that they had never been alone before. 
you know, they've never traveled by themselves, they never had, and, and May, um, in the right hand corner, was interviewed on the radio station, she, she said, I was so nervous getting on the airplane, like, she said, I, I thought, what if I don't, what if it doesn't go where it's supposed to go, you know, and all these <laughs> the typical things of a young person, um, but they both felt this kind of confidence um, that they didn't have before. And Dima, who ha had traveled in, in Europe with her family before, said that one of the things her parents always said, you know, don't say what you are or whatever. And she said, and after the experience at the airport, saying that she was from Palestine, she said, I'm not going to say anything anymore, you know. And so she said that she's on the airplane, she, she flew back via Kentucky from LA. And on the flight to Kentucky was a man who was sitting there and she said he kept looking at me like, giving me this look and I was really scared. So I, I just pretended like I was sleeping and, and she says I was just so, so scared. And she said, and when we landed, the man said, so where are you from? And she thought, oh God, what do I say? You know, and she said, at least it's landing. She says, well, I'm from Palestine. And he says, no kidding, I have all these, you know, my church is, connects with the church in Bethlehem and all this stuff. And he's like, why didn't you, I wish you would have told me that in L.A. because we could have had two hours on the plane and I have so many questions for you. And she, she thought to herself, well, isn't that a lesson? Like, <laughs> allow yourself to be who you, she said, I'm always going to allow myself to be who I am. And, you know, she was, it was, it was very special. Another project that we're doing through um, Faces of Hope is this project called Ziyarat Zetun, which is Arabic for visiting the olives. And this is a project that um, we dreamed up early on in the Faces of Hope. As I said, we feel that the um, olive harvest is a time when can you, if any of you have traveled to the Middle East in the fall during the harvest time, it is a celebratory time. It's hard work. It's a time when all the community comes together and people stop their day jobs and go out and harvest the olives. And it, it's sometimes by family, but also colleges let out of school and they go to the villages and help the farmers who might not have their sons living at home. And so it's a real, and, um, community building time, and it's also been an opportunity when Israelis who are involved in the peace movement will come into Palestinian villages and help with the olive harvest. And it sometimes is the first time that Palestinians will see Israelis outside of the uniform because they're coming to help the harvest, not as occupiers. And for the Israelis, it's sometimes the first time that they see a Palestinian it isn't somebody that's threatening that threatening to them or um, somebody that they're fearful of. So it's a real, um, upper, uh, real positive, hopeful thing. <laughs> and so what we've done is to we we've now become um, great importers of Palestinian olive oil. And should you be interested, um, <laughs> we have cases and cases and cases of um, fair trade olive oil that. We've um, imported. We are with some partners that we have in Toronto, Canada, um, from from the West Bank, uh, and we we bring the olive oil to communities, um, to a house party, to a after church social, to college campuses, to conferences, and we set it out, and we have people taste it. Many of you have had the Arabic bread and the olive oil, and so. People experience something about the culture, and I'll tell you, you open up a bottle of that olive oil from the Annapolis area, and it, you can smell. It's like, well, the first time I smelled it, I was like, oh my God, this smells just like, you know, these villages around Annapolis, and even for Palestinians who are like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, no, vill no village makes as good olive oil as my village, you know, they always have to tell me about my village and our special collective thing. But um, they are very, uh, even they will come and order it by the case because of the memories that and, and the taste that comes through.
through the olive oil. So it's a way of reaching people to talk about the olive harvest, to talk about um, the, the, what a special time it is, uh, as well as educate them about the realities. Um, what's happening to the farmers? Why can't they get to their olive groves? Why is it so difficult to get 750 milliliters of olive oil from, from Palestine to the United States? So there's a, there's a whole story and narrative to be told through this, this product, through this thing. Um, and we've done all kinds of things. We, uh, as I said, we've taken um, delegations of Americans to go help pick in the villages. Um, uh, olive trees, we've created a lot of resources. I brought a, a few here. Um, one that tells stories about nonviolence and the olive harvest, uh, some vignettes of little stories, a uh, whole background piece about fair trade and how this fair trade business of olive oil has been get, getting started and the kind of collective. And actually, this last year, because of our efforts and some um, other organizations who've picked up selling olive oil, we've actually created a market for it. Um, the first year there was 1,500 bottles sold through our Canadian distributor, and, and within one year it was doubled to 3,000. Mm -hmm. So, and this year they're expecting it to be 4,500, even though it was a bad year. So it's, it's also like making a difference <laughs> in people's lives. Uh, we were even at a, this corner picture was at a fair trade fashion show <laughs> that was organized by a community in Chicago. And um, so we modeled with our olive oil. It was kind of fun. So there's all different creative ways um, to address this. This is just a few things about our, our work in the West Bank in Gaza. Um, this is some of the work of our um, Quaker International Affairs representatives that are um, in Jerusalem. And one of the things that they do that they don't emphasize when they talk about their work, but I think is really important, is that there are a lot of organizations like Christian Peacemaker Teams, the International Solidarity Movement, the Ecumenical um, uh, Peace Teams. There are various groups who are uh, are foreigners who are in the West Bank and Gaza helping Palestinian communities by being observers, witnesses, accompanying um, people. But they themselves don't have a place to go and talk together. Like, it's pretty stressful to live in Hebron, if any of you have been there. Uh, it's pretty stressful to live anywhere over there. <laughs> um, and as foreigners, you sometimes need a place to kind of, like, let your hair down and just say, oh my gosh, I don't think I can stand one more minute standing at that checkpoint or seeing seven-year-olds getting beaten with sticks or whatever. Uh, and so our staff has brought this, uh, they created a kind of peace team form where once a month they, everyone goes to their apartment and they kind of talk about things. I, I think that's the kind of quiet, not so showy type of work that um, Perhaps Quakers are sometimes known for. Um, they also, uh, Kathy is the, one of our staff is in the red hat and the left. They also do uh, nonviolence trainings, teaching people different exercises to do with young people. Um, and uh, they've worked with, they, they don't, they're invited. I mean, villages will find out about um, the kind of trainings that they do and they'll be asked to come and um, one, they have great stories about these discussions about nonviolence where um, apparently in one village um, outside of Tokarum in the north, this woman who doesn't read and write or anything but came to the, to the workshop and participated because it's all done in Arabic um, and she said, going to use nonviolence with the Israelis. I'm going to use it with my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently all the women in the room said, yeah, that's right. I'm tired of her. <laughs> and then she said, the whole workshop then changed. Like, it was like, I'm just going to apply this to my direct right, you know, uh, what seems
seems practical and necessary. And I think that that's also like the beauty of it. Um, there's also a, an activism festival that's held once a year with um, young Israelis. Uh, and it's kind of like a, sounds kind of like a Woodstock kind of thing where, <laughs> where like there's things going on all day long in tents and people talk and um, have food and play frisbee and things like that. So okay, the season of all of that. Um, I just wanted to end with this slide. Um, cause when I saw it the other day, I thought, you know, it, the wall is a pretty, pretty much a, not a very helpful thing. When people feel that they have to build walls in order to gain their security, when they build walls to keep people out, this whole notion of separation, um, and, and really, to me, the fact that people embrace separation is very depressing. It's sad to think that, you know, whereas separation in, in, in American terms, we, we think of as a negative thing, but <coughs> a lot of people in the peace movement, quote unquote, think separation is the goal, to divide the communities. Um, so I, I think the wall is kind of a metaphor for where this, issue as is right now. Um, the reality is that people want to be separate, that they, you know, Palestinians feel like they just, you know, get out of our lives, let us live um, freely, and, and Israelis feel like we just want our security, whatever it takes. Um, and I think these footprints about rising up, I, I don't know, just suggested to me that, you know, the wall is not going to stop it forever, that the separation um, isn't going to last, uh, and that there are so many young people that we see and hear about and work with um, in Palestine and Israel that really are the hope for a future because they don't have those walls. Mm -hmm. They aren't there. And <coughs> I'll stop there. Thanks. So as I said, um, um, we do have a lot of literature. Um, there's a lot of stuff on our website, but these are these um, kind of glossy, um, background papers, and we also have a nice brochure that talks about, it, and it has our addresses so that if you want to organize a, your church, having an olive oil house party, or uh, you want to be on this, you know, when the speaker comes through, just to let us know. So. Be in touch. Take extra copies for friends. I don't want to have to take it on there. Des Moines office on the um, yes, it is. So the, central um, region. If people are interested in the olive oil, we have we have the central region has quite a lot of olive oil in the Des Moines office. And I drive back and forth here. Um, there are other people who drive back and forth, and I'd be happy to bring some if there are people who are interested in doing that. So our telephone number is on there. Can you also just ship it UPS or whatever? Yes, we can. Okay, we certainly can. Do you, do you sell it to the Tim Hortons?